Hi everyone, today I'm here with Dr. Adi Felice, a infectious disease pulmonary and critical care uh, specialist who's been practicing in the field for over 40 years. So um, Dr. Adi Felice, thanks for being with us today. You're welcome. Before I get into more of the details, could you kind of describe what pulmonary and critical care involve? Well, pulmonary is a specialty with dealing with the lungs and critical care is a specialty dealing with uh, sick people who usually are in the intensive care unit. So could you kind of give us an overview of the most common cases you see in uh, each of those as well as infectious disease? We see diffuse problems in the uh, critical care unit. We see people who have severe sepsis and shock and substance abuse, uh, withdrawal, um, cardiac problems, arrhythmias, heart attacks, surgical abdomens, people who have perforated this guy and it's a, urinary tract infections that are out of control. So, in general, it involves almost all organ systems, and uh, it's the sicker population of those people. When are people taken from, like, emergency to critical care or, like, an another different um, department? How do they distinguish? Um, Severity of illness. Mm -hmm. So, oh, okay. if someone is felt to be severely ill or felt mm -hmm. to... Um, not be able to be cared for on the floor for various reasons, including nursing reasons and intensity of care, and mm -hmm. as well as severity of illness, usually is where the determination is made. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your, um, I believe you're board certified in four different uh, areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of walk us through um, what lead you to medicine and particularly uh, those different specialties, subspecialties? Well, I finished medical school in 1974. Mm -hmm. And then went on and did an internal medicine residency. And in the meantime, I was in the national I was in the National Health Service Corps town, and I did some emergency rooms. So I finished my uh, internal medicine in 1979, and then there's a board exam for that. And then I did infectious disease for two years at the University of Arizona. And there's a board exam for that, and then I did a year of pulmonary, mm -hmm. and finished and took that test, and mm -hmm. um, then. Fortun well, fortunately or unfortunately, people who I believe finished specialty training and took exams before 1990 mm -hmm. did not have to take recertification exams. Mm -hmm. So um, I've I do internal I do mostly not I don't do a lot of general internal medicine. I do some, but I do infectious disease and pulmonary based on mm -hmm. uh, those certifications. And then critical care um, uh, is something that I certified in, I believe, when they first allowed it, uh, and that was in the 90s, so I have to research for that every 10 years. Okay, and is your practice divided by a certain portion of each of those, or are they all kind of blended in together? They're pretty much blended in. I do infectious disease consults and pulmonary consults here, and I also chair the infection control and pharmacy committee here and at Sutter, mm -hmm. um, Sutter Medical Center. Mm -hmm. and, and then I run the ICU here from a medical perspective, mm -hmm. okay. medical point of view. And so could you walk us through a typical day in your life from when you get into uh, when you leave? Usually get in about 7.30 and uh, see patients in the ICU and see whatever came in overnight and then see the follow-ups. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we have ICU rounds and I just finished those. Mm -hmm. um, it's multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. We have pharmacy, mm -hmm. dietary. Nursing, and physical therapy, and respiratory involved in those. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm done with that, I finish up doing my seeing my patients in the ICU, and then I go upstairs and uh, see whatever consults and whatever follow-ups in both uh, infectious disease and pulmonary. And uh, when do you usually leave each day? Most days, it's somewhere between 5:30 and 6, but probably one or two days a week, I'm here till 10:30. Yeah, yeah, so can, those are long days. Mm -hmm. And how many uh, days are you on and off? Do you have call? I have call probably three or four times a month. Right. But we have an electric on, electronic ICU that monitors ICU patients. And uh, we have someone who's up all night who is usually able to take care of things without calling people in. Mm -hmm. We've got residents here, and then I'm also... Um, responsible for Sutter Medical Center, but we have nurse practitioners there mm -hmm. overnight. So the combination of those groups of people usually keeps me in bed at night after 10.30. Mm -hmm. 
So you're usually you're on call three or four times a month, but you're usually not called in? Usually not. Okay. Occasionally, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, how is the lifestyle of a pulmonary critical care slash infectious disease specialist different from that of other specialties? Well, it's, most of what I do is hospital-based. So um, I'm in the hospital. I'm in one spot. I don't. I personally don't have an office. I used to have an office, but probably about seven years ago, mm -hmm. uh, we brought in some infectious disease people, pure infectious disease people, who mm -hmm. take care of the office infectious disease practice mm -hmm. for us. And I'm here. Mm -hmm. I've also got there's a residency program here, family practice mm -hmm. residency program, um, and I spend a lot of time with the, uh, those okay. young doctors. So it seems like you do, um, besides your main clinical work, you do mentoring and administrative work. How do you recommend a physician, a new physician, pursue those avenues? Do you have protected time built in? Most of what I do in those areas, I fit it in mm -hmm. uh, as the day goes on. My primary mm -hmm. responsibility is taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am when there's a patient who needs to be taken care of. And the rest mm -hmm. of the stuff gets done. And a lot of the teaching stuff is, uh, is in, during patient care. What's the most challenging aspect of pulmonary critical care medicine? The hours somewhat because you spend a long time in the hospital, but in some ways that's good because it's uh, it's shift work. Mm -hmm. So when I'm done, I'm done for the mm -hmm. most part. Mm -hmm. And a lot of critical care is seeing people who are very, very sick, who have a high chance of dying. So mm -hmm. you know, there's a stress, there are stresses associated with that. Mm -hmm. What's the most rewarding aspect of how uh, you feel turning a bad situation into something that's good mm -hmm. and you know with infectious disease and pulmonary mm -hmm. helping to make a diagnosis where someone can actually be treated for a mm -hmm. um, condition that maybe wasn't obvious in the first place mm -hmm. perhaps uh, as opposed to something like maybe like oncology where well they save people they, they yeah. actually do a lot of good stuff now mm -hmm. i meant like it seems like it, it'd be more immediate in your case versus like critical care is immediate mm -hmm. um, pulmonary and infectious disease infectious disease can be immediate pulmonary is usually more chronic so are there any misconceptions about uh, you feel well we spent you know the, you're in dealing with people who are critically ill but that doesn't mean that's what you spend your whole day doing mm -hmm. uh, it's not exactly hours of boredom moments of terror the way you describe anesthesia but you know there are when I'm here for a 15-hour day, there's downtime. I go and take walks around the hospital. Mm -hmm. But then periodically, uh, things are there's a dis there mm -hmm. disasters hit. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be ready to deal with those. Mm -hmm. And how, how would you recommend matching into a good uh, internal medicine residency and also a, a good fellowship in if someone's going to pulmonary or a critical care or um, even infectious disease? You have to first decide. You'll be doing clerkships in medical school, and you'll decide mm -hmm. what turns you on. And then you'll take a look at programs. And you'll probably have mentoring from the people who are in those areas. Mm -hmm. Like if you were interested in infectious disease, you'd have some infectious disease people who are at your school mm -hmm. who, who um, would suggest uh, good places, mm -hmm. uh, might know some people in the area, and mm -hmm. give you advice. Normally, in order to do infectious disease and pulmonary and critical care, you need to do internal medicine first. So that'd be the first question, is where are you going to go to do internal medicine? Or if you're going to do internal medicine. There are a number of people in this residency program who, it's a family practice residency program, but they end up doing hospitalist work because they've enjoyed the experience of being in the hospital and taking care of sick people, and they've decided they don't want to go to the office. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we also have a fellowship year that someone each year has filled on um, the spot, and uh, so they get some extra training in critical care, and infectious disease, and pulmonary. So things like mentoring would be, or seeking a mentor would be important. Uh, do you recommend doing research in that field to uh, help your application? Or well, I I don't know. I mean, there's it depends on what you want to do. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't know that it makes any sense to do something just to get into a program. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've got to have. A desire to do the research, mm -hmm. or else you're going to waste your time. Mm -hmm. And then it'll probably it'll probably be obvious yeah. when you apply that mm -hmm. this is not really what you're what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And most people don't do a lot. At least when I was training, don't do a lot of research while they're in medical school or mm -hmm. uh, or internal medicine. You mm -hmm. do the research when you're a fellow for mm -hmm. the most part. I guess that's another aspect of this. You have to make a decision what you want to do because different fellowships are 
stress different things. And some are very clinically oriented and others, they really expect you to spend a lot of time yeah. doing in-depth clinical or even bench research. Mm -hmm. And since you're involved in so many different things and medicine is always changing so fast, how do you recommend seeing, or how do you even stay on top of all those advances? Well, I've got partners and there's a 30 person group and we're always pulling articles for, for each other to read. And I go to a couple of conferences a year, and I like to listen to a lot of podcasts. And, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of stuff online that kind of keeps you up to date. And for um, employment types or employment settings, it seems like most especially they're moving towards like bigger groups and not so much like individual, like, like private practice. Are there still opportunities to do private, like individual settings? Uh, well, we're in a private practice. We're in a 30-person group that mm -hmm. covers Sutter and Mercy, and we actually also. Uh, are the critical care people for uh, um, hospitals in Napa and now Vallejo. Mm -hmm. And we've worked up in Paradise uh, um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago in the hospital that just burnt down mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Paradise. Um, so you, there is the possibility, I guess, of maintaining some independence. Mm -hmm. um, there's always an issue of whether you're going to get mm -hmm. taken over or... Yeah lose contracts because they've mm -hmm. got their own doctors within their own system and we've had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. But you got to prove you're worth mm -hmm. employing. So it seems like there's still an opportunity. Are there any like strategies that you'd recommend if you're someone's trying to do that more? Or? Well, first of all, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm not, we're a 30 person group, so yeah. we're not like, we're, we're not individual mm -hmm. practitioners. Yeah. So I'm not recommending, I don't, you can't do critical care as a solo person, I mm -hmm. think. Because if you do, and there is one person in town who does do that, but he ends mm -hmm. up covering with us. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way he could possibly do it. Yeah. You can't, mm -hmm. you can go crazy. So it's like locum tenens work probably won't work out? No, locum tenens is possible. I mean, mm -hmm. there are, you know, there are people who, in smaller hospitals usually, that will hire people to mm -hmm. do some work. And we would even, uh, if somebody wanted to take some shifts and we have mm -hmm. openings, we would hire people to do mm -hmm. shift work. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's to their benefit or ours specifically, mm -hmm. but some people, that's what they like. Mm -hmm. you know, they want that independence. Well, someone suggested that perhaps right out of residency, you do a little bit of locum tenens work to scope out geographic areas, uh, maybe like practice settings you like. Is that something you'd recommend or would you recommend just... Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't do that. I mm -hmm. had a general idea of where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I, saw, I had actually added it past. I answered an ad in the New England Journal, and that's how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. Do you know who he is? I think he's at our school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's the f your school. Mm -hmm. He was the guy who recruited me. Oh, nice. So this was back in 1982. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So he left. He was part of our group, mm -hmm. and he left our group. Did some certain things. So it would be more like administrative. Yeah. Kind of like work. Okay. It seems like you have like busy days. Um, and some of these get very long and intense. How do you, what tips would you give us to avoid burnout? Or what, what things do you do to avoid burnout? You have to have some hobbies. What, what do you do? I play some golf. I've got grandkids. I like to mm -hmm. take walks. I like taking pictures, mm -hmm. doing some reading, so traveling. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone to 80% time, so that's actually given me a lot more time to do other things. And is that something you've done over in recent years? or Last year. Oh, last year? Okay. Mm -hmm. no. I'm talking about the 80%. Mm -hmm. For years, I've always felt as though I had no desire to retire. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to pack it all into a certain period of time. I was going to try to enjoy life along the way. Yeah. Before that, were you like incorporating like longer vacation times into your year or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, and so you just want We to have a fair amount of vacation time in our group. Mm -hmm. I just added to it. So you get more traveling in? Well, more of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Are groups pretty conducive to, or pretty like receptive to want, like you wanted to like shift your schedule around? The, co the practice has to be covered. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. And then it's a negotiation. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got 30 other people and mm -hmm. people, you know, everybody wants Christmas off. Everybody yeah. wants spring break. Mm -hmm. So you, nobody wants to work holidays. Mm -hmm. So you've got to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. um, you put a system in place that looks fair and people buy into, and that's how it happens. And mm. It works. Are there certain personality types that are best for the subspecialties you're in? I, I know internal medicine is known to be more like cerebral compared to some of the other specialties. I don't know that that's the case. I mean, no. you know, I guess there are certain personality types. Surgeons are supposed to be a bit more aggressive, and maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. but I've seen a lot of aggressive internal medicine people, and there's certainly a lot of cri aggressive critical care people in my group. So, um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, anyone could. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, how have you established a work-life balance? Uh, you mentioned lately you've moved into like 80% work, but are there any things that you've done uh, even before that to uh, kind of establish that? Well, I try to do a little bit of exercising every day. Mm -hmm. I used to swim a lot, but I don't do that since I'm in the hospital here because I used to be able to do it between hospitals when I was traveling, when I was going mm -hmm. to multiple places. But I still try to do that. I take a couple of walks during the day. I mm -hmm. take weekends and you know, mm -hmm. play some golf. I play golf on Wednesday afternoon often. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to make sure that uh, I set that time out and that it becomes time that you can always find something else to do other than mm -hmm. personal stuff. You can always mm -hmm. find some more work somewhere yeah. and you try not to do that. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of set, set your barriers? Just set some boundaries. Okay. Uh, I have a funny story. I, uh, there was a lecture being given on uh, physician burnout, and I was at a meeting, and I announced at the end of the meeting I was leaving because I was going to play golf. <laughs> and then it, uh, as I got to the golf course, I got a text from one of the administrative people here asking me whether I was coming to the burnout conference. <laughs> so, okay. no, I texted back, no, I'm taking care of this myself. <laughs> That's funny. We talked a little, a little bit about employment types. Um, are there any tips that you, you give like new physicians to manage their finances well since we don't really have financial training? or Don't like... spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Save. You don't need a really big car. Mm -hmm. You don't need the most expensive house in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, any, like, would you recommend us invest in certain things or mm -hmm. get a financial stick, advisor? Well, you know, put away as much money as you can in your 401k and stick mm -hmm. it in the S&P 500 and just let it sit there. Mm -hmm. Okay. At your age. Now, as you mm -hmm. get older, you know, I've got a bunch of bonds and things like that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, as you get older, the, the percentage that of and how aggressive you are mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. It has to change. Mm -hmm. So you take more risky, maybe? Not as you get older. You should be risky now. Okay. Because you've got a lot of time to recuperate. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the statistics, you know, what the S&P 500 has done over the last 100 years, if you got a long enough time period, you're going to expect you'll probably meet some of that, you know, close to that. Mm -hmm. If you've got five years or whatever, and you're going to, you know, you're 60 and you want to retire at 65 and you throw all your money in and everything drops 40 percent, then you got trouble. Mm -hmm. If it drops 40 percent when you're 30, who cares? Because you're mm -hmm. still putting money in and it's going to come mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Also, for, uh, for your individual practice, uh, are there any tips you'd recommend to maximize your income in those with your practice? Is it just working more for medicine? Um, from what we do, uh, we have some a number of our shifts are voluntary, and we get mm -hmm. paid per shift in mm -hmm. some of those voluntary shifts. Mm -hmm. um, that's, most, that's, that's mostly it. It's pretty much time-based. Yeah, okay. yeah. How has medicine changed since you started practicing and where do you see it going in the future? I think it's going to be larger controlled groups ultimately, mm -hmm. probably. And I think the groups that want to stay out of, you know, hospital system type things, mm -hmm. Mercy Medical Group, Sutter Medical Group, if you want to contract with those people, you're going to have to sort of prove your work. Mm -hmm. It's going to be harder for smaller groups. and I think it's going to be very hard for small groups. Mm -hmm. And I think individual, I know I've spoken to people in one of the uh, physician, large physician groups in town who decided a number of years ago that they don't want to support individuals. They'll support family practice practices, but not that of individuals. They want to support mm -hmm. larger groups. Mm -hmm. So would you choose the same career path or the same self-specialties again? I think so. That? Yeah, I enjoy what I do. Mm -hmm. And what kind of led what do you think contributed to allowing you to find those specialties or subspecialties that you really resonated with? When I was in residency, I had a guy who was, a, he was one of our teachers who was a really good IV guy. Mm -hmm. Sort of struck me as somebody, if you knew IV, kind of knew medicine, so I decided mm -hmm. to do that. And then I was looking for a job doing infectious disease, and some people gave me some advice and decided mm -hmm. to learn how to do bronchoscopies, and the bronchoscopy people, which are the pulmonary department, said, we can't let you do that, but we just have an opening for a year. Do you want to uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to spend a year with us? And then mm -hmm. my infectious disease research overlapped with pulmonary research. I did it on coccidia and mycosis, so mm -hmm. they allowed me to take the pulmonary boards. Mm -hmm. And then since I took the pulmonary boards, when the critical care boards became an option and critical care was something I always really liked to do, if critical care were a subspecialty that was available to me when I finished medical school. 
or, uh, or internal medicine, I probably would have done a fellowship in that because I like critical care. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. For the last question, what advice would you give us to become good doctors? Focus on being a doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that direct you in different directions, making money, you know, doing all mm -hmm. sorts of things. But I think you're best at what you do mm -hmm. and you focus on it. And you're... The other thing is, don't think you know more than you know. Mm -hmm. Think you know less than you know. Mm -hmm. Ask questions, work with people, look stuff up, mm -hmm. and don't be arrogant. Mm -hmm. And to be humble and prioritize becoming skilled in your craft. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you again so much, Dr. Felice, for being a part of this interview. Sure. Uh, thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions yeah. for Dr. Felice, please leave it in the uh, comment section, and I'll ask him and get back to you guys. Also, let me know who, who else you'd like me to interview, interview next. And uh, thank you for watching. Have a great your day.